Hello, I'm Mod Morgan, companion of Seth and Knight of Shambhala. This is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. Uh, for this episode, we're doing something slightly different, which is uh, to talk to or allow to talk someone called William Morton, also known as Broderick Wallace, uh, who's a friend of mine and uh, also a companion of Seth. Uh, and I thought I'd ask him about something that I've always wondered about, which is the magician Franz Spaden, who is a name that crops up quite a lot in people's training and whatever. I, I've never really looked too deeply into it. I've got more than enough on my plate, although I know he came up when I was looking at the Abramelin uh, arrangement of different demons and, and the rest uh he had a theory that you could arrange them into a pattern that was similar to or the, basically followed the 36 decans which is an egyptian system which i thought was quite an interesting insight as as you know i'm quite interested in the decans and they're quite important aspect of uh, the type of magic that we do Anyway, that was about as much as I knew about Franz Baden, although he has this amazing reputation and this book, Introduction or Initiation into Hermetics. So I thought I'd ask someone, i.e. William, who seems to know a thing or two about Franz Baden, uh, whose system he's been following quite closely in a, a, an organisation that I'll perhaps tell you a little bit about. So I thought this was quite someone who's actually working the system rather than just sort of pick up the book and try and make head or tails of it. I think he does a quite a good job of of setting out what the what the interest is and hopefully why it's connected to Egyptian magic. Well, of course, hermetics, anything that's hermetics is going to kind of lead us back to the Egyptian system anyway. Uh, but apparently Franz Baden, like most magicians, realistically of the past hundred years or more, uh, are always interested and draw a lot of inspiration and knowledge from the mysteries of ancient Egypt. So over to William to tell us a little bit about Franz Baden. Which is great. This is the, this is the way I like it. So we're here to talk about initiation into hermetics a little bit, Franz Baden, but there is a kind of caveat on that. And that is, I'm not one of these guys who's like, you know, the the expert on all the occult literature and that. I'm very intuitive and I'm very much about the practice itself. And of course, with the practice itself, there is a, a central core to the practice, which is, which is what well, you might just say secret, simply. So we'll have to sort of skirt around that a little bit. This is, this is just, this is one of those annoying things about the occult. We're, we're in the occult. And we're trying to communicate the occult on camera. And so we, this is the problem we, you know, perenni perennially face. So, uh, so I have the, uh, the manual with me, uh, initiation into, uh, hermetics. And of course, there is a, a massive crossover with ancient Egypt, uh, between us. So I've actually marked off a couple of little uh, quotes in the book that do concern Egypt. And uh, I guess I'll just, uh, well, where would you like to start, Mog? And thank you very much. Okay, so Franz Baden, accessing the memory banks, born 1909, died 1958 in a, in a, a fascist prison, I guess you might say. He spent three and a half years yeah, he spent three and a half years in a, a concentration camp, a Nazi concentration camp as well. So it's unfortunately it is littered with sorrow. His story is a very, very heartbreaking story. And uh, I must admit, it's one of those funny things. Uh, obviously, being a, a member of uh, of Session and of course the uh, the companions of, of Set as well, but being within Session. It's a funny thing. We don't talk about Franz Baden that much. I think it's a, it's a funny twist of fate because that's perhaps the way he would like it to be because he doesn't talk about himself much in his, his, his work. He's very, he's like, 
it almost as if he could sense the end coming and he knew he had to you know get this out of him this this very uh practical training uh regime so it's all about the work really it's all about um engaging uh in the practice um <clears throat> so the practice itself uh it's basically uh oh there's, there's two of you now on the screen <laughs> it's basically a, a meditation program um i did write i did write um a uh, <clears throat> a, a description of the practice in as, as few words as i could uh, uh as i could as i could muster a magical and mystical training program of uh self deification in service to divine providence and that sounds it sounds very lofty of course it does um so as you can imagine uh beginning with step one if you imagine that the, the the first phase we pass through is kind of uh getting ourselves in order basically dealing with ourselves in the physical world so uh obviously discipline is uh, uh a large part of that um and where the rubber meets the road is in organizing your life in order to facilitate two one hour ideally two one hour meditation sessions per day or sometimes because life's difficult I, I might end up doing the whole thing in the evening so basically you're making a massive sacrifice of your free time and unfortunately you miss out on a lot of reading time um it might be tricky if you're in a relationship as well all this kind of thing so it, it, it is a very solitary thing whereby you undergo these series uh, of structured meditations in order to develop the uh, the I was going to say the inner psychic capacities but it is kind of structured whereby we have the physical training the psychic training and the mental training but before all this begins um, there is a theory section which is a, a kind of way of um, describing the universe whereby we have if you imagine we have the akasha at the top which is the uh the fifth if you like and this gives birth to the elements in turn and of course the elements are not to be confused with the the actual elements of you know fire water air earth or, although they do bear a similarity they are spiritual or, well spirit they are the, the forces of um uh reality if you like they are the, the constituent parts so as you progress in your meditations you're gradually building up towards being able to perceive and uh harness these forces um but really it begins with uh i'm afraid that i can only think of a vulgar term and that is sorting your shit out really um yeah so uh if we if i take myself back to the first exercise in the book which is to completely observe your thought process and your mind and remain outside of it and yet somehow record it so it's basically like a, a memory exercise and of course memory does tie into the uh, the magical capacity the uh the skill in uh perhaps retrieving or or or, or imprinting an image within the um uh the, the mental forces if you like uh so we go from watching thoughts then we move on to or watching the, the and, and recording the train of thoughts as the mind naturally is and as this process uh, as you engage in this process you notice that the thoughts begin to slow down and become more um 
less less chaotic if you like so already you're feeling those changing processes within your psyche you're becoming more clear-headed more more precise if you like so we move from that exercise to holding one image or concept in the mind to the exclusion of all, all else so we become very directed and, and one-pointed of course this also you know bringing up the word hecker this is a, a way of conjuring up uh, an image within the um the uh within the um within the astral basically uh i'd like to bring in here as well the idea of contraction whereby when you meditate on one image or concept the exclusion of all else and you're in that sweet spot you're in that zone and it's like it's all that exists there's, there's a very peculiar thing that happens and that is you begin to take on the properties of that concept and an even more peculiar thing is that concept can communicate back to you so this is where the the, the mysticism comes in as well and then the next exercise after this the, the third one of, of the first step is the um <clears throat> the vacancy of mind and this is notoriously the most difficult this is where you're going to get a lot of chit chat online trying to work this out and i do have like a, a, a i think it's about an hour long discussion uh, just centering around this uh, exercise on my channel so that's how long it takes it, it you could talk forever about this one exercise and it does seem to be in some strange way the the kicker once you get this in motion and i would say it has been described as simply being calm uh, 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 and just engaging with a, a, a pure nothingness but you see how do you know you're not simply thinking about nothing uh, that there's a strange paradox there you, you have to be nothing you have to be pure being itself and i guess it conjures to mind the image of uh if you imagine the image of a buddha uh you know sat under a tree that classic image that we're all f familiar with and he has that kind of halo around his head and that look of peace on his face if you imagine it's that's a that's a very good image that's a very good uh description whereby you enter a state of complete peace non-worry that you, your life doesn't exist nothing exists and in that state when pushed to extraordinary levels over let's face it years very extraordinary things happen and um this i guess this is where the secret part of the practice begins as well because you may begin to uh, gain an inclination of uh, bringing in the the Crowleyan thing, your, your true will through signs and symbols. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Apparently, um, he used to use Book Four as a training manual with his early students, and uh, I have to admit, I mean, obviously. Uh, Alistair Crowley was, uh, um, I'd say, my second introduction to the occult. I started off with David Conway's uh, Magic and Occult Primer and then quickly moved on because obviously you walk into Waterstones and Crowley's kind of at the bottom of the shelf somewhere. He's accessible. So you get all excited. You bring a book back home and it's like, I can't understand any of this, you know. But, but I did find a wonderful picture book on uh, Alistair Crowley and things gradually began to make sense. And I think through kind of, th through some kind of luck or synchronicity, I happened to walk into the bookshop one day and, and, and found book four. And uh, that book, that book is accessible. And I think that's probably the reason that he used it because it, it is very, very meditation focused. Yeah. So, so there, there is a connection between Franz Bard, uh, Barden and Crowley. In, in that respect and apparently they uh, had some correspondence as well well i guess the, i guess the classic era that you know the people that we keep on talking about you know alistair crowley dion fortune and franz franz Barden is a little less well known but he's gra he's gradually gaining prominence uh, obviously through through the wonders of the internet
uh, these days. His name is is more videos are appearing all the time. More schools are uh, are emerging, and uh, I suppose getting to the point with Franz Baden. If we take, and this is, I think this is erroneous anyway, making this very hard line distinction between the magician and the sorcerer. But if we took that stereotype and began with that, you begin to understand, uh, I guess, what Franz Baden is up to. Because if you followed all the instructions in Initiation into Hermetics, and uh, of course I am some somewhere within that book, so I can't. I can't. I wouldn't talk about the next two books after because you know um, I I don't have any experience in that respect, and that is where uh, obviously being a member of the uh, Companions of Set, the, the Morgan Witches, comes in. So uh, I do think that these things can work beautifully in tandem, but there is that notion of a division between the two, whereby with Franz Baden, you can become an internal magician like you can literally run the whole thing in your head but like i say that that these two things that they're not really opposites but it's a, it's a kind of way of, of thinking about it not not ne not needing the tools although the, the tools do come in apparently on, on the second book you could literally uh, well the idea is that you can uh, become an adept through the first book initiation into hermetics uh, simply uh, through meditation and the application of um, see this this is where another really big concept comes in and that's morality there is a process that you go through uh, called the soul mirrors and uh, I actually constructed uh, my own soul mirror book here and you can see that one side is black they're kind of opposite it's, it's a whole opposite black and white thing going on so we have the dark soul mirror and we have the light soul mirror and in the middle you can uh, you might, might not be able to see this on camera but there actually is uh, some silver sort of sellotaped paper in the middle to actually form a mirror between the two parts of, of the book so the idea is is that you diligently work on and record because obviously writing is very important and this would tie into the the book of shadows as well uh this this is a very uh i suppose we'll get onto that in a moment but basically you yeah that's yeah so basically i, I guess you could say we have two books we have the the soul mirror book and the we, we, we just tend to call it the uh, the magical diary in, in the franz baden tradition but it is the same as the book of shadows so you have these two things running in tandem so with the soul mirrors you're going to be really honest about what a bastard you really are you're going to write down all the bad things yeah all the bad things you think all the bad things you do and it is it is this is where you can see obviously franz baden um although it's universal there is a very strong christian christian current running through it so there is that kind of whipping yourself kind of aspect to the practice but obviously to balance that out you will also write down everything that you're that you're good at and you will assign all of these good and bad qualities to the uh, to the four elements. So, for instance, if you're, you know, sort of arrogantly talkative and always want to be the, you know, the uh, the center of the party or whatever, you you know, you put that under the fire element. Or if you're very um, obviously these, it's, it's a bit like astrology. We are all of these things. But you're going to find the specific areas in your life, say, for instance, with the water element, where you might be retractive, overly emotional, emotional. You might take a thing, offense to things too easily. So obviously, I mean, this is a, a key aspect of where the meditation comes in, because the more meditation you do, the, the more balanced in terms of the elements your your personality will become. So you'll know when you meet a true uh bardenist because you won't be able to offend him basically so uh coming on to the the book of shadows the magical diary what i find is this <clears throat> being artistically inclined myself as well it will be filled with pictures as well as words it's as if you're writing you you're writing the story of your rise <laughs> good points and the bad points 
recording your meditations, recording the phase of the moon also. Uh, the, the phases of the moon are not detailed in initiation in termetics, but I've found them to be extremely powerful. So, for instance, if the, the moon is in your opposite sign, you may feel stressed and agitated, or especially on a full moon, you can be sitting there in a full moon and your practice is just humming dark moon it might be a little bit more difficult so you're recording all, all of these details uh, <clears throat> various aspects of um, uh, I guess you could say you're writing a uh, you're, you're, you're writing a spell it's a continuous spell process but uh, if you include pictures as well it's also it's also uh, it, it ties in with the the notion of obviously what we would describe as hecka. So, for instance, I know it's it's terribly conceited, but I, you know, you you could say you could draw a picture of yourself, how you imagine yourself to be, and I found as you as you're drawing pictures, and this mixes with the meditation, and let's face it, a lot of solitary sorrow and all, all this kind of stuff you will begin to inst instinctively incorporate certain symbols will speak to you you might catch glimpses of them so you you're basically you, you're basically creating your own personal uh, religion in a way with all its symbol sets and signs obviously heavily rooted in tradition because we all are but you're it's as if you're getting a dose of the collective unconscious as well and all these things are weaving together the meditation the the, the magical spell of your book of shadows uh, uh, the soul mirrors uh, practice and if you obviously there are there are other factors as well uh, uh, but all these things in conjunction they're all very subtle, but they're all moving you forward in a way whereby every now and then you will notice a, a, a leap forward in progress. Okay. Well, as as with everything, Barden, there, there isn't a lot because it's it's just all about the instructions, really, and, and the process. But hopefully my bookmarks remain intact here. Yeah, so this reading through the book, this is what I found. <clears throat> we have two quotes. The first one is, he who knows other systems of initiation will find a certain parallel with my system since all paths leading to truth must be the same. Let me mention here the Indian yoga system concerning the snake power, which is in accordance with the systems of the Egyptian mysteries I have quoted. So basically there he's saying I have quoted the Egyptian mysteries within this book. Obviously the, the, there is Egyptian imagery on some of the early editions as well and if we move to the the, the actual epilogue of epilogue of the book <clears throat> it says uh this book actually is uh the first tarot card the magician as well it's it's it's, it's like a, a literary embodiment of the first tarot card and there is a picture i will get onto that quote in a moment there is a There is a picture near the front. This is this is quite a, an important uh, image uh, where you have basically it's the the tarot card of the magician, but uh, redesigned, if you like. Anyway, getting onto that quote. Anybody who has been reading about the tarot will know as a fact that there are twenty one more cards called the Great Arcana beside the first tarot. Tarot. It says tarot yard here, but it means tarot typo tarot card which is symbolized by the magician in the egyptian mysteries being the cradle of all wisdom and, and that really spoke to me there the egyptian mysteries being the cradle of all wisdom so he's, he's basically saying there in one sentence that everything goes back to egypt really yeah yes yeah he's right he's right I, yeah we're, i agree and you see i mean Obvious, I mean, we, we have to talk about Egypt because we're on your, you know, we're on your channel. Okay. Yep. Right. So Egyptomania began when I was a little boy, come home from school, watching the, uh, the kids' television, and there was a show called It's a Mystery. 
And it was a new theory at the time. Basically, they covered the Orion correlation theory by Robert Bovell. The host was a guy called Neil Buchanan. You can find that on, on the internet. Uh, it's a mystery, isn't it? Is the, the TV show. I actually managed to find that episode the other day, which was really surreal to watch that. So they had like a kind of a model that they'd made of the three pyramids and they had the Sphinx and obviously a, a black background with the stars. And this absolutely blew my mind. You imagine I'm sitting there after school eating a sandwich or something and I'm like, they built the stars on the ground, you know? So that, that really captured my imagination. And then as I'm getting older, I'm becoming aware of, um, you know, uh, you know, the four horsemen, uh, Robert Bavell, John Anthony West, <coughs> uh, Robert Shock, Graham Hancock, that, that whole vibe. And I, obviously I know you, you, you see things slightly differently and, and, and that's all cool and everything. But I, I, I definitely, whoever you're into, there's always things you agree with, always things you disagree. I mean, there's things, I mean, like when I saw Robert Bavell on Ancient Aliens, I was like, oh man, why are you on that show? Like, you know, when I talk about Robert Bavell, I mean, I, See, actually, I'll get to the point. So I'm reading all these books. I'm working as a security guard at the time um, uh, in Maidstone called the Checker Centre. And as, as part of my patrol, I had to patrol the, the rooftop of the shopping centre. So I was gradually learning the constellations. I'll be up there. But, you know, there's, you know, there's uh, Osiris in the sky there, Orion. There's, you know, Isis and all, all this kind of thing. And I would spend a lot of time just simply staring at Orion, just not quite sure why I was so fascinated. And my locker gradually became stacked up. Like you'd open my locker at work and it was just all books on ancient Egypt. So <laughs> there's no lunch in there. So I spent every lunchtime reading about ancient. I'd be walking at my head. My, my boss used to call me Pharaoh. I, I even grew a, like a, a goatee as well. It was, it was, you know, when you're in your twenties, come on. So, uh, I decided, uh, with the encouragement of my boss as well, um, that I had to go to Egypt. So at the age of 23, uh, bought the ticket, and uh, it was um, it was a blast. It was it was uh, it was really mind blowing, and I'm really glad I did it now. Even though you could say, I mean, most guys in their 20s are wasting money on you know wine women song and all that and i just had to go to the pyramids and obviously i had that kind of a little bit of the nerdy thing going on kind of lost in my own world and all that so obviously standing in front of the pyramids walking and i didn't have much money so i kind of had to even though i did go to saqqara i did spend most of my time in giza so pretty much every day i would just spend all day you know, I, I went inside the Great Pyramid a few times. I'd, I'd spend pretty much most of my time around Giza, just absorbing the uh, the vibe there. You see, this is the funny thing about chance, fate, or you know, divine providence, as as they would say in the, the Franz Baden tradition. I'm coming back from the pyramids, and I see John Anthony West standing at the bar, and I'm like, I wasn't I wasn't mature enough to handle it because I'd I'd come here because of these guys. I couldn't believe it. Like I was, there he was, John Anthony West. So I was overly enthusiastic. I made a bit of a bit of a fool of myself. I got got a picture with him. He, I got his signature, and uh, he actually he actually told me off. He, you know, he had a go at me. You know, put me in my place. So I sort of walked off with my tail tucked between my legs, and I'm in the gift shop looking at all these little Egyptian models and that, and I just felt a tap on my shoulder. So I turned around and it's John Anthony West and he said, uh, if you want to meet Robert Bavell, he's coming in the main doors at three o'clock. So I, I, without learning my lesson, I just did exactly the same thing with Robert Bavell, just completely freaked him out. But he signed my book for me. So obviously it was like I went back to work as a conquering hero. Not only did I go to Egypt, but I literally met my heroes there. So I was pretty unbearable for a while. So as we obviously as we begin to mature you see those books would introduce me to characters like giordano bruno they would introduce me to words like like hermetics and this kind of thing so yeah that's a great link yeah and that's a that's quite a moment okay well going back then to a final bit as to the you know finish off the france Baden thing what um 
Because I know, yeah, he's like the magician's magician, isn't he, in, in a way as well. You know, a lot of people who are kind of quite well known as magicians in their own right, they all kind of re really relate to this stuff. It's quite, it's a little bit obscure, but less obscure. You know, it's more obscure than Crowley, but it's it's kind of on the same sort of level. Is there a final bit then it, uh, that you want to say about Barden and uh, how people should sort of, what they should do? Or you recommend that as a, as a, as the best way into this sort of material, this territory? Yeah, carry on. Okay. Um, yeah. So condensing things down to this this chit chat in the in the short time that we have, I guess we could just move it to um, going through a you know a very difficult time. Uh, I guess you could say my life's falling apart. You know, I'm going through a divorce, all this kind of stuff. And I discover in the landscape near me uh, uh, some megalithic ruins. And then I begin to get very interested in, in the history of uh, my own country. And at this time, uh, a natural paganism is developing. And I realize, oh, there's nothing here. It's all gone. Like, you know, the Romans pretty much wiped it out. And uh, together with my uh, friend Samuel Connor, uh, as named on the channel, we uh, we created a music project as an it's a, it's like a kind of spontaneous intuitive paganism because we didn't really know what we were doing but I kind of just felt like I wanted to do something so I timed it for the winter solstice 2012 this music project and literally brought the CD to the stones and ever since that day we have met up on winter solstice uh, at this very same stone dolmen but you see the thing is I guess. Uh, the more time that you spend a, a, a sacred site like that, it kind of works its way into your mind. Uh, around this time, I'm discovering Franz Baden. I'm having my first forays into meditation. And as I'm sat in meditation, I'm getting glimpses of the landscape, of the sunshine, just flashes of uh, communication, if you like. So then I had to embark upon a very, a very difficult intuitive journey of trying to work out what the landscape was saying to me, which I've kind of detailed on my channel, which through a few years I managed to, or or, or, or rather, I managed to in intuit a female presence there, which through various dreams and visions, and by this time after the, the divorce, I was living in my house alone. So I had like two years alone in my house. And um, in conjunction with these intuitions from the landscape, I decided that I wanted to do something magical that was, I wanted to just completely do it, like complete it. And uh, I do apologize. There's so many strange twists, twists of fate. It becomes a cliche. But by a strange twist of fate, this, this, is, this is what happens when you live magically, you know. Rufus Opus's book, Seven Spheres, just happened to be sent to my friend by mistake when he'd when he'd ordered a different book so we shared this book we read it and we said oh god this is really simple you know and um there were a couple of things i didn't agree with uh i know i'm jumping ahead a little bit here i'm sure there'll be a lot of people who are familiar with the seven spheres trithemian magic system so basically i decided that i didn't want to start at uh jupiter i was going to start from the beginning and work my way up in the order of the kabbalah so it's a very strange time in the house alone whereby I would try and time it with uh, what I perceive to be the correct moon phases to contact each of the seven angels of the planets. So this took a whole year to do. And that was that was very much my uh, my mission. I wanted to, you know, to complete a, a, a magical project. And as you can imagine. There is a there is a short piece of text in, in that book, which is the beginnings of the headless right. So I decided, oh, I'm going to do the whole of the headless right. So I found Gordon White's uh, the Chaos Protocols. So I would perform the entirety of the headless right, and as you can imagine, for each of the seven angels that were contacted, strange synchronicities would occur that were exactly uh, synchronistic with the angel. But I will say that I didn't have any voice-to-voice -voice communication. It all happened through dreams and synchronicity. My dreams became infested with 
presences and messages and you name it you know and i think stress helps us uh, this is an awful thing to say but stress is actually a, a very powerful magical ally when you're going through hard times it you, you, when your mind is you know like that you, you add in magic obviously this is again where initiation into hermetics comes in because this is a safe way to do it so i started off by completely kind of blowing the doors off uh, in, in the midst of a crisis and um <clears throat> what surprised me was the egyptian element that was coming through there was a very strong egyptian element around about this time i found your egyptian magic podcast and avidly you know devoured all the videos and um <clears throat> i will say it wasn't until uh the interview that i did with yourself uh, something clicked for me and um I have no problem sharing this whatsoever because it's it's just out there. If you notice it, you can. It, it may not blow anybody else's mind, but in my circumstances, it blew my mind. And that was the gateway, if you like, the door and the eyes. Because what I'd found through the, you know, the pagan experiences in the in the English landscape, it was all about a door, the dolmen, and the spirit that was coming through if you like the the female presence it was all about it was all about her her eyes so yeah exactly behind you yeah yeah the yeah. Uh, the gateway so obviously um as we see on egyptian sarcophagi this false yeah. door with the eyes above it yeah. i was very i was very surprised to find that there was an, an absolute parallel in my experiences in the english countryside that was had the uh, a dark a, a, get we'll get lovecrafty in here a dark ancient presence you know i mean this we talk i mean this this was i mean uh there were some ups and downs yeah. obviously going on uh, uh uh during this process but that's to answer your question, obviously, sometimes it's hard to answer things uh, very quickly. That is where the, the link with Egypt really uh, confirmed itself for me with the door and the eyes. Right. Well, I'm sure you could still this. I think it's called Band Camp or something like that. One of those open source uh, music things where you can use samples and you can add your own things. I'm not very good at the music, but like doing, say, the, there's a thing called the spinning mantra. There's a kind of, which I've got to kind of do that. Or even you could, one idea I had, you could maybe convert the 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 vowel chants that you see in some of these very old Egyptian spells, because they were quite into music, and work of some way of transposing those as kind of mu music patterns. So you should... The words of power that you get in those old spells, you could look at them as kind of uh, as songs, really. Oh, yeah, ab yeah absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. First of all, I just want to uh, pay respects to my teacher, Martin Fawkes, who mysteriously appeared in my life just at the right time and uh, invited me into the Session School of Hermetic Meditation. So anyone that's interested in Franz Baden, that's the way to go. And um, as I've been in the school for three and a half years now, I've actually started my own circle, which is Session Circle, Bluebell Hill. Uh, obviously, because the students are, begin are beginning to increase now, it does reach that time whereby the students of Martin will begin to take on students. So that's another option. If, if, you, if you like that kind of a little bit of the pagan vibe and, and that kind of thing, I, I can act as an intermediary. So obviously, the, you know, people can, people can check that out if they want. But I would say, the, where the respect comes in is, uh, I guess it's for, it's, it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult. It, it's a big sacrifice, but I would encourage people uh, that that sacrifice is is definitely worthwhile to uh, to bring in to bring in a, a trope from my teacher. Natural ability does not trump hard work when it comes to the long term with Franz Baden. You can just start. You know, whoever you are, as long as you're, you know, fairly sensible, as long as you, you've got a work ethic, you can gradually build yourself up through these uh, these meditation 
uh, the step work, if you like, and uh, you will you will experience um, you will experience wonders. Great. Okay, so yeah, the channel still left, so they can find you on YouTube and check out your videos first, and then you know, yeah, leave a comment or make it's easy to make con contact via via those things. I, I find. Yeah, yeah, videos. absolutely, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, to me, I think it's very important. It, although it might seem a little bit bombastic, it's very important to have. Yeah. a magical name as well as your you know your, your birth name so on youtube i am under the name of broderick wallace so simply type in broderick wallace on youtube and it'll all it'll all come up and you can see the links there to my circle and uh i also have a music channel as well which you can find the links through the um uh through the broderick wallace channel Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now, and thank you very much. But don't go away. <laughs> it's an empty indeed.